I think the best way to start this video is with a puzzle, a smaller version of uh, what you perhaps saw in the thumbnail. We'll build up to that one later. Now start with two nails or two thumbtacks that are in a wall. And what I want you to do is hang a picture off of those two nails. And when you do this, uh, you're allowed to loop the wire around the nails uh, in any way that you like, and then tie both loose ends of your string or wire to your picture. And as long as it hangs, you're good. Now the only stipulation is if you remove either nail, the picture should fall. So if you remove the first nail while leaving the second alone, the picture should fall. Or if you remove the second nail while leaving the first alone, the picture should fall. I should say this is not a trick question in any way. It is completely possible to do this, and I really want you to actually try it. So find two nails or two thumbtacks that are in a wall, um, or I don't know, work it out with pencil and paper if you don't feel like getting up or if that's more your style. Now, surprisingly, there are actually infinitely many answers here that work, and I'm gonna share with you the simplest one. So, go around the first nail clockwise, then go around the second nail also clockwise, then go back to the first nail and loop around it counterclockwise, then the second nail, again, counterclockwise. And if you do this, you'll notice that the picture hangs but if you remove either the first nail or the second nail, the picture falls down. Now the real question is, how did I know that that would work? And it turns out there is an incredibly beautiful mathematical explanation behind all of this, and I am extraordinarily excited to share it with you guys. However, I should say that if you found the two nail version of the problem too easy, um, you may be excited to hear that there is an arbitrarily many nail version of the problem. So you can imagine putting a million nails in a wall, then there is some way to loop a string around all one million of these nails so that a picture hangs off of it. But if you remove any one of these nails, any one of these nails, the whole thing collapses and the picture falls down. So if you found the two nail version of this problem too easy, uh, maybe you can pause the video and work on that one. In the meantime, however, I will explain to everyone else what is going on here. What I'm going to do is call moving around the first nail clockwise A and moving around the second nail clockwise B. This is just so that I don't have to keep saying move around the first nail clockwise, move around the second nail clockwise, you know, whatever, over and over and over again. Also, I'm going to call moving around the first nail counterclockwise one over A or A inverse. And similarly, moving around the second nail counterclockwise will be one over B or B inverse. Finally, I'm going to call the configuration where I do nothing at all, where I don't wrap around any nail and the picture just simply falls down one. Why am I doing this? Well, I'm hoping to create some kind of analogy uh, between this stuff and multiplying numbers. And it's worth reiterating that this is just an analogy. However, um, initially it does kind of seem to work. I mean, think about it. If you do A, followed by one over A, you get a one and the picture falls down. Similarly, if you do one over A followed by A, uh, you get a one and the picture falls down. And same thing with the Bs, you know, B followed by one over B or one over B followed by B, both give you a one and the picture falls down. So at least initially, our intuition does seem to agree with our notation, which is pretty cool. With our new lingo in place, I wanna go back to the solution that I gave to the original problem. So if you remember, first I went around the first nail clockwise, so that's an A, then around the second nail clockwise, so B, then around the first nail counterclockwise, so one over A, followed by a one over B. Now on one level, it should be clear why this solution works. Because if I get rid of the first nail, that's the same thing as getting rid of any term involving an A, so I'm left with a B times one over B, which is a one, and the picture falls down. Similarly, if I get rid of the second nail, that's the same thing as getting rid of all the Bs, so I'm left with an A times one over A, which gives a one, and once again, the picture falls down. So that is super awesome. However, clearly there is something fishy going on here because this does not explain why this configuration allows the picture to hang in the first place. If this really were like number multiplication, everything would cancel out right at the start and the picture would not hang at all, but clearly it does. So even though this might look like number multiplication, something is very different. 
And just to give what I'm talking about a name, number multiplication is commutative, which means the order in which you multiply the numbers does not affect the answer. But that is not what is going on here. Notice that if you do B A 1 over A 1 over B, um, everything cancels just as you would expect and the picture falls down. However, because in my solution I did A B 1 over A, 1 over B. I just switched that order in the beginning. The picture seems to hang. So it seems as though A will only cancel with 1 over A if they are right next to each other, and B will only cancel with 1 over B also if they are right next to each other. So what we are dealing with here is clearly very much not commutative. The order in which I do things definitely matters. In keeping with standard mathematical convention, I'm going to stop writing 1 over A and 1 over B and replace them with A inverse and B inverse. And the reason I'm doing this uh, in part is just to prevent that temptation to just cancel the A and 1 over A wherever I may see them. And if you rewrite the original solution to the problem in this way, it becomes A, B, A inverse, B inverse. And actually, this little doohickey has a special name in mathematics. It is called the commutator. And commutators are an incredibly important idea in mathematics. Actually, I'd be remiss not to mention that we have secretly sort of stepped into the ubiquitous and uh, vastly important overarching uh, branch of mathematics called group theory. Now, Obviously, I can't really do justice to group theory in the in like a 10 minute uh, YouTube video. Um, a decade long YouTube video would not be enough. Um, so what I'm going to leave you with is a one, how these ideas uh, come up in more exciting and interesting contexts uh, um, other than just, you know, looping uh, strings around nails. And then number two, I want to talk about what makes this example particularly interesting, like why why the string around the nail example is particularly exciting. And then number three, I want to tell you about how to use these ideas to solve the version of the problem where you have, I don't know, like a million nails on the wall. As I mentioned before, if AB were the same as BA, the commutator would just turn into one. So the triviality of the commutator allows you to test whether the order in which you do A and B matters. Let me give you two examples of places where this comes up that are not very technical. So take a Rubik's Cube, and let's say rotating this side by 90 degrees is A, and rotating this side by 90 degrees is B. Then notice if you do A, B, that is not the same as doing B, A. So you get a different cube depending on which of A and B you do first. And once again, this can also be seen by noticing that doing A, B, A inverse, B inverse does not return you to the original cube. Um, here's one more example. So take this hexagon. And I want you to think about all of the rigid motions you can perform on this hexagon so that after you perform them, you have the same outline as you did at the start. So one example would be rotating by, say, 60 degrees. If you rotate by 60 degrees, then at the end of that rotation, you have the same outline as you did at the start. Um, another example would be flipping along this uh, vertical axis. Say flipping uh, along this vertical axis is A and rotating by 60 degrees is B then once again, AB is not the same as BA. And doing AB, A inverse, B inverse does not return you to the original hexagon. And of course, um, depending on your taste, uh, there are lots of other more advanced places that these uh, ideas come up. Now, non-commutativity is, of course, very interesting, and I hope I've convinced you that it's a widely occurring phenomenon that is very useful to understand. But there's a lot more than just non-commutativity, which makes the example with the string and the nails particularly interesting. And I'm going to try and illustrate this to you by uh, contrasting with the other two examples that I showed you before. So if you remember in the case of the hexagon, I called flipping along this axis A and rotating by 60 degrees B. Now let's say I do A, then B, then A again, then B again. Notice I return back to the original. Now what's interesting about this is I found a way to return back to the original without doing any backtracking. It's not like I did A and then A backwards to get back to the original. No, this is definitely more interesting than that. If I were being more systematic about this, if I took the same attitude that an explorer might have, um, and I were, let's say I were trying to draw a map, um, let's say I start at this location. 
And then from this location, I figure out what doing A does and what doing B does. And then I do the same thing from this location. I figure out what doing A does and then what B does. Notice, however, that doing A and B from here doesn't actually take me anywhere new. It doesn't bring me to a new state that I haven't been to already. So doing A takes me back here and doing B takes me back here. And similarly, doing A from here uh, just takes me back to the original. So what I found in my map is an honest to goodness loop, like a way to go from one back to one without doing any backtracking. If I were to finish this map, by the way, uh, this is what the whole picture would look like. And as you can see, there are lots of loops in it. Um, these maps, as I'm calling them, are actually called kaleigraphs, if you want to look them up further. What a kaleigraph is, is, you know, you pick a set of moves that you're interested in. In this case, the moves I picked were A and B, and you just draw a map of, you know, all the places, all the different states that your moves can take you. And in this case, this is what that map looks like. You may be interested to hear that the kaleigraph of a Rubik's Cube has loops as well. So let's say uh, this is A, this is B, and this is C. Then if I do A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, notice that I am back to the original cube. So this is once again an interesting way to get back to the original without any backtracking. Of course, I can't show you the full Cayley graph of a Rubik's Cube because there are 43 quintillion different states that a Rubik's Cube can take, which may seem like a lot until you realize that uh, for our humble situation with the two nails and the string looping around it, the Cayley graph is actually infinite. And what's more, there are no loops in it. Um, so let's say this is one, and these arrows represent A, B, A inverse, and B inverse. Then this is what the Cayley graph looks like. And as you can see, it has this beautiful fractal structure, which allows us to get a sense of the shape of it, uh, despite its infinite nature. And it's amazing to see all of this beautiful mathematics hidden inside just two nails and a string. Um, unfortunately, I can't prove to you that this Cayley graph is correct. Uh, the mathematics is beyond the scope of this video. However, one practical implication is that pretty much however you wrap your uh, string around your nails, the picture is guaranteed to hang. Um, I mean, think about it. Let's say you did A, B, A, B, then A seven times, then B inverse 12 times, then A six more times, say. You are guaranteed that you will not have accidentally made it back to one because there are no loops in the Cayley graph. The only way you could get back to one is if you did a bunch of stuff and then you did the same stuff backwards, which would of course cause everything to cancel. Let's start with three nails. And just as before, I'm going to call going around them clockwise A, B, and C. And going around them counterclockwise is A inverse, B inverse, and C inverse. Now the trick here is to shove commutators inside other commutators. Uh, what we know is that A, B, A inverse, B inverse, will turn into one if you get rid of the A's or the B's. But unfortunately, this combination does not involve any C's. So what I'm going to do to rectify this is replace the B with the commutator of B and C, and B inverse with the commutator of C and B. Why? Well, first notice that these two commutators are actually inverses of each other. So when I get rid of the A's, uh, they wind up next to each other and everything cancels. Also, getting rid of either the B's or the C's causes these new commutators to go away, which once again causes everything to cancel. So now we have a 10 move combination that involves all three nails and it should work. And indeed, if you try removing any of the nails, it actually falls, which I find extremely satisfying. And you know, you can keep doing something similar if you want to increase the number of nails. So for four nails, you could replace A with the commutator of A and D, and A inverse with the commutator of D and A. Um, let's actually do this for five nails. So I guess I'll replace D with the commutator of D and E, and D inverse with the commutator of E and D, which is a 28 move combination. And though I needed a heavier picture for this one, it was still pure satisfaction. <laughs>
All right, I just got done editing the video, and first off, I wanted to say thank you so much to all of my new subscribers. Um, another thing I wanted to say was that I uh, it recorded a lot of material for this video that wound up not making it in. Just stuff on how to do large-scale demonstrations as well as big physics simulations with uh, lots of nails. But unfortunately, that stuff didn't really fit in with the tone of the video, and it also made it way, way too long. So maybe I'll revisit that stuff on another day if I can figure out a more engaging way to tell those stories. Um, and I think that's it for me, so don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and peace.